which is co-hosted by both the Stockholm Environment Institute at York, so I should introduce myself, I guess, first. I'm Lisa Embassy, who's the Centre Director of SEIY, um, and it's also co-hosted by YESI, the York Environment Sustainability Institute. Um, and unfortunately, Sue can't be here uh, just now, but we have Sheila, who's still doing some organising at the back, um, so representing YESI here too. Um, so the seminar, uh, as you know, is going to be um, on trying to work out what are the true health costs of air pollution. And it's quite a timely seminar, I think. There was a recent WHO report, which I think came out um, just last week, uh, which had some quite startling um, data behind it. Uh, so just a few facts to set things in motion. So apparently outdoor air pollution has risen by about 8% in the last five years. That, that's quite a large increase, considering air pollution is quite bad anyway, around the globe. Um, and there are particular locations in particular cities around the world where the increase is, has been really quite um, rapid um, in terms of air pollution. Places in Middle East, Southeast Asia and East Asia are sometimes the most impacted um, cities. Just to try and put uh, some of the, the, the values in some sort of context, so Delhi um, has a PM 2.5 concentration, annual mean concentration of 1.2 micrograms per metre cubed. And just so that you've got something to relate that to, um, York's PM 2.5 annual mean concentration is 12 micrograms per metre cubed, which is still above um, the World Health Organization's <coughs> 10. So there are really big disparities in terms of the levels of air pollution um, globally. And we want to try and make sense of all of that in terms of how do we actually cost the impacts associated with that air pollution so we can hopefully have our signal to do something about it. Uh, so we've got a couple of firsts, I think, in trying to do this seminar. Um, one of the uh, perhaps most challenging things is that we are linking up live with Stockholm. Um, so we have one of our panel members, Johan schumann Schirner, our policy director in SEI York, is in Stockholm. I don't. I hope hopefully he can hear me now, but I won't expect him to respond to this now. But he will come in um, as we have the panel debate. I should give you um, just a quick introduction to how we're going to try and structure this seminar. That might have been him. Uh, so we're going to have uh, a 30 minute seminar from Nick and I'll give a proper introduction to Nick in just a minute. Um, we're then going to have a panel discussion with six members I think on the panel, some of whom are sat over here but I'll let Karen introduce those people to you as well, you'll probably forget by the time we get around to that. Um, and during that discussion we're hoping that we can get some questions uh, from the audience um, as well as questions to and from within the panel themselves, which would be great. So, uh, I should introduce Nick Miller. Um, I first met, met Nick, I think, what, about five years ago, something like that. Uh, we were working together on uh, the UNEP WMO Black Carbon and Ozone Assessment, which came out in 2011 and was quite instrumental in, in setting the scene for further work now on short-lived conduct pollutants. Um, and Nick was responsible for the economic valuation of the impacts of SLCPs on three different things, climate change, human health, and my favourite favourite ecosystems, which unfortunately we're not talking about today. Um, and you were absolutely brilliant in that report, I think, because you helped all of us make some kind of economic sense of, of the results that we were producing. Tiny bit of background to you, you um, received your PhD in Environmental and Natural Resource Economics from Yale in 2007, uh, and since then you've been an Associate Professor at Middlebury um, College working in the Department of Economics. Uh, and you're also involved in a number of important working groups in the States, including the US EPA's panel on economy-wide modeling of the benefits and costs of environmental regulation. And you've also advised the National Bureau of Economic Research. So you have a wealth of experience and knowledge, which hopefully we can um, learn from today. So I will stop there. And without any further ado, Nick, the floor is yours. So thank you, Lisa. Thanks for the invitation to talk. It's very much a pleasure to be here. Um, just in terms of motivation for the topic, um, economic development and the production of things and the consumption of things produces air pollution. That's not news to anybody. And it's also not news that historically, throughout the stages of development, that pollution was often produced in an unabated fashion. And 
so I'm sure we've seen pictures like this, perhaps not from this particular place. This was taken in the late 18th century, no, 19th century in Pittsburgh, <laughs> um, where I'm from originally, in the process of manufacturing steel. And there's just no attempt here to, to do anything, right? It's not even on the radar screen. Here's another picture, perhaps uh, more impressive in a sense. Same era, same place, same process, the manufacturing of steel. And when that degree of pollution, in the sense of uh, the lack of abatement was produced on the scale that it was produced in Pittsburgh and in other places, led to outcomes like this. Now let's not diminish the importance of use of coal and home heating and early automobile use, but here we have roughly middle of the day, mid-morning hours with darkened skies. Okay? So when we have outcomes like that, those early episodes generated concern among citizens, right, and in, in a sense, perhaps indirectly, um, in government. Right? It's intuitive that such episodes, such degrees of pollution, would potentially have effects on human health and the environment broadly, on ecosystems, and, and perhaps anthropocentrically directly on health. Um, perhaps what's more important from the policy point of view, certainly today, is whether background levels and chronic exposure, long-term exposure to those background levels, has an effect as well. And then the question is raised, were or are there demonstrable, quantitative, statistically significant effects associated with those exposures, starting early on and moving towards the present? Well, there's lots of literature, um, as, as we stand here today, there's lots of literature that has been published in epidemiology and in other fields that has demonstrated this link. I'm just showing uh, one particular piece that was published relatively early on, as far as this literature goes. And that was an article by Lester Leighton and Seston that appeared in Science roughly in 1970, yeah, published in 1970. And this paper, it's credited with being one of the first, I'm not actually sure if it is the first, um, that demonstrated in a statistical sense that there was a significant association between exposure to PM10 and adult mortality rates. More <laughs> recently, the literature has supported these findings broadly. Um, I'm citing two papers here that focus on the U.S. These are recent publications, but they are only recent editions of a long-standing set of studies that go back to the 1980s. And they basically um, agree with what Leighton and Sesson found. These particular studies are focusing on PM2.5, but they're basically showing the same thing, a statistically significant association between exposure to fine particles and adult mortality rates. Importantly, and I'm going to pick a little bit on the WHO standard, um, this research, the Leighton and Sesson research, these papers, and insofar as I'm aware, um, the Global Burden of Disease study don't show a safe level of exposure to these local air pollutants, right? There's no clear threshold at 10 micrograms per cubic meter or 8 or 15 beneath which we or ecosystems are objectively safe, right? And so I'm pointing that out in part to poke fun at the WHO, but also um, from the point of view of thinking critically about policy design and thinking critically about benefit cost analysis, if we don't have a level of air pollution at which risk goes to zero, then the choice of the target is really difficult. Some might say arbitrary. All right? Okay, so we've established, the literature has established that epidemiology shows a significant association between human health and air pollution. But critically, I think we need to step back and ask, as an economist, this might not surprise you that I'm asking this, do we need policy? to protect human health insofar as that is affected by air pollution? Or will the decentralized activities and choices of individuals and firms arrive at the right level of air pollution? Now, tongue is firmly in cheek here. We saw the early pictures, right? So you know what the answer is going to be. But I raise this nonetheless. So what does a microeconomist have to say about this? What does a discipline generally have to say about this? Well, we know one way to think about pollution is that these are wastes, the residuals generated through the process of production of things, steel, or consumption of things, like motor fuel that we put in, put in our vehicles. Some residuals are priced in markets. Think some, not all, but some solid waste. Right? 
firms face costs to dispose of used cardboard. Individual households, I know at home, we pay a fee for a firm to come and cart away garbage. So some residuals are priced. And of course, some residuals are not priced. Right? CO2 is probably the best example of an unpriced residual, but so are the local air pollutants, some water pollutants, and toxins. So what? Well, if those residuals are priced, at least in principle, firms and consumers face the cost of disposal. Right? So it's a cost of doing business to a firm to dispose of solid waste, and they recognize that, and they adjust accordingly. We then may still have damages. We might still have health effects. But insofar as the prices for those residuals reflect true value, then we're going to have an allocation, an efficient allocation of production of that thing, which is generating those residuals. Far more problematic is a case where residuals are not priced, right? Where costs are hidden, or to an economist, they're external to a market. Because then in that case, if costs are truly external, then the classic market mechanism as an efficient tool to allocate resources across society breaks down. Prices for products are inefficiently low. Cost of production is inefficiently low. And the market yields an inefficient allocation of resources. For instance, we burn too much coal to make power because the costs associated with combustion of coal aren't generally fully faced by firms, just as an example. So to most microeconomists, that fact in and of itself justifies policy. It justifies an intervention to correct what we'll see in a minute we call market failure. Two other implications that I think are probably less, I'm not sure if they're less well known, but they're less often thought of, is that measures of output, if we have externality, measures of output may be inaccurate, that is, GDP might not capture the number, right? And in addition, measures of growth in that thing, GDP, GNP, whatever it is, may also be inaccurate. And growth matters both from the sort of public perception of how the economic system is doing. We tend to think, well, GDP was growing at X percent last quarter. Things must be OK. I'm going to invest in this particular um, asset. Policymakers pay attention to growth rates more than many other metrics of economic health. Macroeconomic policymakers in particular pay attention to growth rates in setting interest rates, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So the point is, there are broad implications when we expand the notion of externality to be one that affects output and growth. There are broad implications which further, in my view, justify intervention in markets where externalities are important. So I asked that question before. I answered it in some sense right away with the pictures on the first slide, but I answer it again from the perspective of microeconomics, and I, I'm willing to bet that there are lots of other perspectives that would also answer that question in the affirmative. So in terms of next steps, that is, we've identified a market failure, that is the presence of pollution, unpriced pollution. Um, we now need to think about appropriate means to correct that market failure, to design policy. And again, from the economist's perspective, the polluters need to face the cost of pollution to adjust their cost of production appropriately. Or on the other side of the market, demanders need to face the full price of the product. Right? So determining the cost of pollution requires estimating the impacts of pollution, because those are the costs. Health effects, species loss, property damage, whatever, whatever that may be. And one approach to doing that uses what are called integrated assessment models. And these um, tools effectively link emissions, the human activity, all the way through physical environmental modeling to impact and ultimately valuation. And uh, just a citation from some folks on the screen and in the room of uh, a recent example of integrated assessment modeling applied to both climate and, and um, local air pollution. So this is useful, hopefully, in a self-evident sense. But um, we can also be more specific <coughs> and say, look, the, the use of integrated assessment modeling is helpful from the ex ante perspective in asking, what will it cost to implement a policy? And what does society stand to gain in terms of a reduction of damage? 
It's useful from the perspective of ex post policy evaluation. How did the policy do? Did it work? Did we generate benefits? What were the costs? How many jobs were lost, et cetera, et cetera? There are, of course, pitfalls associated with this, as there are in, in many empirical exercises, the first of which is each stage in the modeling process, which I'll talk about in a minute more specifically, um, introduces uncertainty, perhaps significant uncertainty. I'll spend a little bit more time talking about the final stage of the integrated assessment model, which is valuation, converting impacts into their dollar equivalents. And that can make a lot of folks really upset. It's a very contentious undertaking. I'll try to argue to you and try to convince you that it's worthwhile, all the while recognizing that it is contentious and that there's no one right answer. And then finally, as I mentioned before, in this talk, I'm going to push a little bit more on this idea of integrating benefit cost analysis into our measures of output and growth from the perspective of trying to break down the illusion that there's always a zero-sum component to environmental policy. We do environmental policy at the expense of growth, or we have maximum growth, and we forget about the environment. Right? That final bullet is going to try to break that dichotomy down. Okay, so I've tackled the introduction. The remaining portions of the talk will consist of, it's not really conceptual modeling, it's just more of a conceptual discussion of benefit cost analysis. I'll talk about empirical modeling with integrated assessment, and then just a smattering, a touch of results from some recent work, and on to conclusions before we um, get to the panel. So benefit cost analysis, I went back and sort of uh, looked up some papers in the, in the early literature on benefit cost and read around a bit, and, and I found this statement that sums up the rationale fairly effectively. Um, an activity is worth doing if benefits exceed the cost. <laughs> and I mean, who can argue with that? Right? It's just, it's gotta be true. So um, in broad terms, this seems sensible, but I think when we start you know, uh, looking at things a little bit more carefully, we need to be um, more careful about that conclusion. And most, I think most policymakers are, to be, to be clear, more careful than, than just following that, uh, that guidance. So when we think about winners and losers, which is an important implication of benefit cost analysis, this early literature focused on what's called Caldor-Hicks compensation. And that very simply means that if there are winners given a policy intervention, they can compensate the losers, those who bear the, uh, the brunt of the costs. Um, and therefore, in principle, society can be made better off if, given that compensation, we have net benefits. Now, no one's ever arguing that this happens in practice. It's always a conceptual definition. It's always a conceptual criteria. But we do have papers that actually explore and reveal that some economists do care about distributional concerns. And in particular, thinking about whether benefits accrue to particular um, neighborhoods, races, segments of the income distribution, and whether the losers seemingly concentrate in different races, segments of the income distribution, et cetera, and talk and think very carefully about that and evaluate policies according to some metric that pays attention to those distribution of concerns. Okay? So we go from uh, utterly insensitive to these concerns to far more sensitive. Another concern here is that there's an asymmetry in benefit cost analysis, which is well known. This is, this is nothing really new. But there's an asymmetry um, in the sense that costs, this is costs of policy, not costs of pollution, not damage from pollution. Costs of policy are very easily monetized. Right? We invest in pollution control equi equipment. We switch fuels. We purchase natural gas instead of coal. Those are monetizable things. There are other costs, but the bulk often manifest in those categories for environmental policy. In contrast, benefits may be partially or quasi-monetizable at best. And we can think about cases in particular thinking about mortality risk or the valuation of ecosystems or species where it's really problematic and difficult to think about valuation on the benefit side. And it's therefore quite possible that benefit cost analysis leads to a biased sense of the merits of a policy, just based on the ease with which we can monetize. 
Okay, so back to this integration between benefit-cost analysis and the national accounts. The benefits of environmental policy really are reductions in damage, reductions in these adverse impacts. And if those are happening external to a market, or the market, those benefits aren't going to, by definition, show up in GDP. They can't, in terms of conventionally measured GDP. If they're truly external to the market, they can't be there. Conversely, most costs lie within the market boundary. Again, purchasing pollution control equipment, that's a purchase from one firm to another. Buying natural gas instead of buying coal, again, within the market boundary. So broadly, when we think about linking environmental policy to GDP, we have at least the strong possibility for a biased picture of environmental policy when it's the costs that are going to lie within the market boundary and the benefits that, by and large, aren't. And in light of that, I would propose that we need an alternative measure of national output. And this is, again, not a new suggestion. It's in the literature. I'm just emphasizing it. We need a measure that, in fact, recognizes these costs, these non-market costs or external costs. And that measure would simply be, in this case, defined as environmentally adjusted value added, which would just be GDP less pollution damage. Seems like a simple thing. Let's recognize full cost of production and consumption. OK, on to empirical modeling. As I mentioned, integrated assessment is a tool that's commonly used in this space. It's a tool that connects anthropogenic activity, anthropocentric activity, emissions, broadly to environmental consequences. These tools have been around for a long time. I think some of the earliest ones were in the late 70s and early 1980s that were focusing on local air pollution impacts. But they've since been applied in the climate space as well. And we're now getting into integrated assessment in water and other areas. And recognize that IAMs, or integrated assessment models, embody what's called a damage function approach. And you can see the damage function here in that we're connecting emissions produced by some human activity through physical modeling to ambient concentrations, to exposure, maybe people, maybe other things, ecosystems, to a link to physical effects, because not all exposed persons exhibit a case of asthma or a change in their mortality rate. We need some functional relationship that's going to establish that link. And then finally, the last stage is monetization. So within the context of policy evaluation, we might have some intervention. For the US, it might have been passage of the Clean Air Act or a set of amendments to the Clean Air Act. And that's, of course, going to generate costs. And I'm going to propose that that's a separate calculation and modeling exercise than integrated assessment. So in a sense, that happens offline. But also recognize that the policy intervention, if it does anything, is going to change emissions. It's going to modify human activity. Otherwise, it's not binding. And when that happens, all of these other things change in the model. That is to say, we have the change in emissions. And that gets processed through the physical model, which links emissions to concentrations. And all these other modules reflect that change, if the model is working right. So we get all the way through to valuation. And it's the change in valuation, it's the change in damage, that's going to reveal the estimate of benefits. Presumably, although it's not always the case, presumably, the policy intervention reduces damages. In most cases, all of these things fall, including damages. And therein lies the benefit. So benefit cost analysis, then, is just about comparing those two modules, however we decide to do that. So I'm going to refer to some empirical results in just a few minutes. And the model that I use to generate those results and to do that research is the AP2 model, which has been used in lots of prior publications. It's been used by the US National Academies of Science and EPA. And you can see in its basic structure, it's very much like the generalized integrated assessment model that I have on the screen. So in order to, I suppose, inform you about the process that led to the results I'm about to show, I just thought I'd go through very quickly in terms of data sources to fix ideas in terms of where the results come from. In terms of emissions, as is standard practice, no matter where you are, I suppose, I'm using emissions data, in this case, provided by EPA. 
right? And so these are measured or estimated emissions for things like power plants and steel manufacturers and estimated emissions for things like vehicles. I then use an air quality model to link those emissions to ambient concentration levels across the US. Uh, I use vital statistics data for exposures, in particular county-specific population estimates by age group, and crop-specific crop census data from US Department of Agriculture and timber as well. And then I use dose response functions, and in particular, for PM 2.5, the two dose response functions that I alluded to earlier in the talk form the link between exposure and some estimated change in mortality risk. Right? And those are mathematical functions that come from epidemiological papers, right? from peer-reviewed research. And then finally, in terms of valuation, this last step I'm going to spend some time talking about because it's the one I probably know more about than the others, but also because it's, it's a, a place where we have, in a sense, a lot to discuss right? as we think about gauging the impacts from air pollution and therefore the impacts from policy. So this is the monetization phase where we go from change in risk or change in yield, if we're talking about crops, to dollars. And so I'm going to ask a question that is, why do we do this? And I'm also going to speed up based on the, the time guidance I just got. So <laughs> why do we do this? Number one, it enables us to rank damages across pollutants. What's a ton of PM 2.5 worth relative to SO2 or CO2? Across sources, power plant A versus power plant B. Across industries and across sectors. So ranking. Aggregation across different damage types. We're going to look at mortality risks, cases of illness, crop yields, materials de depreciation, all expressed in different physical units. You can't add them together. If you want the total impact of a ton or a kilowatt hour, you can't add those together unless you have a common metric. And third, and perhaps most straightforward, it allows us to evaluate benefits directly against costs. Costs are almost always expressed in dollar terms, monetary terms. And we need benefits to be monetized in order to make that comparison. Okay, how do we do this? If I had my, my preference, we'd look to markets, because markets are a great source of information for the value of things. But we don't have markets for things like mortality risks in species, the existence of, or ecosystems. So when we're in a situation where we don't have information from markets, we employ non-market valuation techniques, of which there are two types. Revealed preference, we look for evidence of people's values for these things in market transactions that are linked to environmental goods and services. That is the value of a view in a real estate market, for instance. Or we ask people directly on surveys. When thinking about the value for mortality risk, we know that these values vary across human characteristics, demographic characteristics. And I'm focusing here on the value attributed to mortality risk because it is the dominant source of damage, monetary damage, when you think about local air pollution. So differences in value across age. This has been estimated by Kip Vescuzzi and Joe Aldi, and they find an inverted U-shape with the value maximizing at middle age. I'm going to go relatively quickly. The literature has found differences in willingness to pay to avoid cancer risk across race types. EPA has, although it doesn't use in its standard benefit cost analyses, an income value of a statistical life elasticity. Richer people are more willing to pay to avoid mortality risk. I'm not going to go to gender. <laughs> the literature hasn't really gone to gender either. In a policy framework, recognize that with political constraints, none of these sources of variation in the value for mortality risks are applied as standard practice. That means that our estimates are probably off one way or the other for different groups. But it's pretty hard to imagine applying <coughs> different values across those groups defensive, defensively from the point of view of public policy. OK, so now on to results quickly. These are taken from a 2014 paper of mine. We have aggregate damages, oops, aggregate damages from air pollution outside of brackets. 
and air pollution and CO2 equivalent emissions. This is economy-wide for the U.S. from 1999 to 2008. And you can see these are falling, right? They're falling in both cases. So here's thinking about benefit-cost analysis. One reason that they're falling is increasing stringency under the Clean Air Act. Not the only reason. There was a, a <coughs> bit of a recession coming on in here. Right? All right. So here's EVA, GDP, less that air pollution damage. And here's pollution intensity. Right? Damages were on the order of 6 to 8% of GDP in the U.S. in 1999, and they fell quite a bit, even relative to GDP. Okay, now we get to growth rates. Pollution damages are falling. And here's the kicker. <coughs> when you think about market rates of growth in the U.S. economy, damage, uh, growth is on the order of 1% to 3%. Those are numbers taken directly from the Bureau of Economic Analysis. They're annualized rates of growth. What's really interesting is that the adjusted indicator, GDP less air pollution and climate damage, is, is rising more quickly than the market indicator by between half and a third of a percentage point. So trust me, when that first came out of the computer, I reran it several times because it was not what I was expecting to see until you look at the picture. This is just for the utility sector in the US, but this is the market measure of output. In real terms, it's basically flat. Pollution damages are falling, and therefore the difference between the adjusted indicator, the dashed line, and the market indicator is shrinking. The bottom line is catching up. The bottom line is the adjusted indicator. And if it's catching up, it's got a steeper slope, and slope is an indicator for annual growth rate. So if GDP is rising while pollution damage is falling, that adjusted indicator is going to be more rapidly growing than the market indicator. Okay, and updated results for 2011. I think I'm just about out of time, so I'm just quickly going to say there's lots of heterogeneity within a country in terms of pollution intensity. I'm going to pick on West Virginia. Lots of coal mining, lots of coal-fired power generation, lots of petrochemical manufacturing. Damages on the order of a fifth to a third of GDP. Huge air pollution damages. North Dakota, similar except add oil and gas extraction. 1999. The colors and the meaning in terms of quantitative scale stays the same when I change to 2008. Dramatic reductions in pollution intensity spatially that are concentrated in manufacturing, utilities, and oil and gas extraction. Okay, so on to conclusions. Costs, being careful, damages from pollution often manifest outside of markets. Right? These are the externalities. <coughs> that suggests to an economist a need for a policy intervention to correct that market failure. Thus, we have benefit-cost analysis. Benefit-cost analysis to be done requires damage measurement. Otherwise, there's nothing on the benefit side. Damage measurement is complex, but I would argue, argue feasible. And we have results like this right? that come out of damage measurement that are revealing. And in particular, thinking about the difference in growth rates between the adjusted indicator and the market indicator. And that speaks to the integration, then, of benefit-cost analysis with the national accounts. And in terms of progress, I close with a picture of the same street in Pittsburgh, roughly today-ish and not today. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming, everybody. I think before we kick off with the panel debate, um, uh, does anybody have any questions of, of uh, clarification or, or, or more general questions for Nick? Yes. Yeah, Thomas. I, um, I missed the bit in the middle when you, how do you get to your costs? I mean, what are the assumptions? <laughs> I, Where should I start? <laughs> just give me the main ones. For example, I mean, the, the cost of human life, how would you quantify that? Okay, so what I'm using is the value of a statistical life which is a, an awful term for what's actually a pretty intuitive <coughs> trade-off that we all make. That is, the, the process of valuation here is eliciting a trade-off between a small amount of money and a small amount of change in our chance of death. Sounds crazy until you think about purchasing a smoke detector, 
or a fire extinguisher in your home, or a bicycle helmet, or bottled water when municipal sources aren't clean. This particular estimate is coming from the labor market, and the labor market's showing us the rate of trade-off between on-the-job mortality risk and wages, an idea that goes back to Adam Smith, this idea of compensating differentials. Is it imperfect? I hope this emphasized that it is, because we know that's going to depend on income. There's evidence that it depends on race. Um, there's evidence that it depends on age, right? I think the best way we move forward with this approach is applying the uniform value, okay? Assumption broadly, number one. Number two is the link between inhalation of fine particles and the effect on mortality risk. Epidemiological evidence, as I said, has been around since the 60s and 70s that there is a link, but it's an association, right? These are not laboratory studies, nor should they be, to be clear, <laughs> but causation is not crisp, right? Um, but those two are the, the primary sources of uncertainty, and they are the key in linking emission to, ultimately, to monetizable damage. You haven't given me a number. What? I like that. So, so, for example, I mean, Karen can explain this better, but in the UK we have what's known as a quality. Right. A quality adjusted life year. Yep. So, I can't give you a quality, I can give you a value of a life year that comes from this estimate, be around 200,000. US dollars, I would say year $2,000. If that's a, a, a gauge, right? And that would be around 35 to 40 years of age. Pegged at that, because that's what okay, the labor no, that's, that's says. Give the ballpark for you. Yep. Thank you. Sure. Yes, please. Uh, uh, I went to Carnegie Mellon, so I, I know yep. that's very well. Part of the reason the sky is different now is they closed all the steam, steel yep. mills. So does any of these costing look at the exported costs? To <laughs> uh, for, in my model, no. And off, offshoring and outsourcing is a very po important part of the story. Um, clicker. So I can just here. Part of what's going on here is air pollution policy, but part of what's going on here is macroeconomic change and, and change in the sectoral mix. Um, ideally, without time constraints and without budgetary constraints, we would model this globally, right? And then you wouldn't miss that exported <coughs> piece. Um, so your, your point is a fair one. I have not done the decomposition for these results to show what percent is coming from just moving where the production happens let alone the case that air pollution policy may be less stringent where the production is moving, in which case, right, who knows how this goes. But from a first pass national accounts point of view, fairly powerful. Yeah. So you, you must have known Lester Lave or you knew of Lester Lave? No, okay. Yeah. yeah. Herb Simon was one of the Oh, excellent. <laughs> okay, any other quick questions for, for Nick? Yes, please. Uh, just a quick one in relation to the health costs. Is it just uh, costs of debts that's a factor into it, or what about costs of good health? Um, so this is a, a really tricky question. Um, standard practice at EPA is to count the morbidity states, right? So short-term and long-term illness, in addition to mortality. That is to say, the mortality risk, the changes in risk. What you're seeing here is uh, an attempt to be cautious about double counting in the sense that you would often have, say, a case of chronic bronchitis that leads to a death, or an ER visit that's valuable that then is immediately preceded by a, a, change in, a change in death rates. I'm not doing that because I'm, as I said, being careful about not double counting. But if you did <coughs> engage in calculating all of those morbidity costs, this would, these damages would, would be higher. Not by too much, 5 to 10%, at least according to EPA's estimates. But it's a fair point. Can I ask a potential follow-up question? Sure. Uh, it's just in relation to the epidemiological work that you would have talked about. Just there seems to be a lot of really clever research coming from the US that would suggest that that association, I don't usually mention that it's an association, but that it would be perhaps severely biased, that it would be severe is perhaps an overstatement. I just wonder if you have any perspectives on that. I think there's a lot of clever stuff that's going to use some so the quasi experimental yeah. designs and would suggest so uh, I'm going to say two things, and I'm going to be careful in how I say them. One, there's some of that work that has been applied recently in China using regression dis discontinuity designs that have supported the PM 2.5 mortality relationship in at least a quasi-causal um, way. 
Two, a lot of the literature, you're specifically thinking of the econometric literature, right? Yeah, and I guess it does support the it does support the research that you're that you've talked about in this study, but it's just that it would suggest that the relationship is stronger than perhaps it previously right. believed. It's not that it's coming out and say that there is no uh, link. It's, it's yeah. not, in fact it's coming to say that there's a stronger link than would perhaps commonly perceived in these cases. So um, the papers that I'm aware of in the US setting that use quasi experimental designs don't look at PM two point five. They look at TSP or they look at PM10. And I'm not an epidemiologist, so those of you who are can speak up. But I think the mortality signal is much noisier in those coarser uh, particle groupings than PM2.5. So it's not, insofar as I'm aware of that literature, it's not an apples, quite yet an apples to apples comparison in the US. Yes, please. Uh, yes, thank you for the talk. I was wondering if. For the actual policy in terms of taxation, does this actually inform what the tax levels might be? So when you say taxation, you, you mean like a Pagobian tax? Or do you mean existing taxes on some other product? I guess more like a Pagobian tax. Yeah. So um, most of my dissertation work um, focused on the, the estimation of what those taxes would look like, would look like. Um, so these results can be used to inform policy design in that sense. And in particular, what I was doing was calculating source plant specific Pagobian taxes for different pollutants. And it's a really neat thing to do. It's a, a lot of fun as a researcher. I went shortly out there after the EPA and gave a talk about that and found out the hard way that there's just no way that we're going to move towards Pagobian taxation, number one, and number two, have it vary by plant or industry. Or, right? So, Yes, the apparatus can be used in that way. Uh, I have doubts about the political feasibility or the policy feasibility <coughs> of that approach. Think loads of non-economists in the room. Would you like to tell them what um, Pagillian taxes sure. is? Sure. Um, it's <laughs> taxing <laughs> either a product or an emission according to the damage per physical unit. So if we make a, ton, uh, if we make a kilowatt hour at Trax power plant, right, that's going to have some damage socially. If that plant were taxed according to the monetary value of that impact, that would be a good Okay, so this is all making me very happy. I'm, I'm a health economist by background, and, and um, it's a while since I've heard about Pigu and, and Calder Hicks. It's all marvellous. Thank you very much. Sure. Um, so let's <laughs> invite our panel to the front um, and introduce them. We have. Um, Four extra panel members um, in the room and one online. How, how do we get Johan? Um, I'm here. Oh, look. <laughs> okay, marvellous. So let, let's um, let's introduce Johan first. Johan Schulen Schierner. Is that a sort of attempt at your name? Apologies if that's completely wrong. Um, Johan is the policy director for the Stockholm Environment Institute. Um, and has uh, done lots of research on air pollution policy in particular. Um, so welcome, thank you. Um, Mike Ashmore, come, come to up front. Uh, Mike is Professor of Environmental Science in the Stockholm Environment Institute here at York and um, does research on the impact of air pollution on human health and ecosystems. We have James Lomas. James is um, a research fellow at the Centre for Health Economics in the um, team for economic evaluation and health technology assessment. Um, so he knows all about qualities. Thomas, you can, you can ask James about qualities as well. Um, Helen Weatherly, also a health economist at the Centre for Health Economics. Um, and Helen's worked particularly on public health recently, also in the Team for Economic Evaluation and Health Technology Assessment. And last but not least, um, Professor Tim Doran. Um, Tim is in the Department of Health Sciences, Professor of Health Policy, but also has a public health background and an interest in environment and health. Um, I should introduce myself as well, apologies. Um, my name is Karen Bloor, so um, as I said, I'm a health economist by background, but I'm also the university's research champion um, on health and well-being. Um, so um, I'm here as a complete innocent to air pollution, um, and it's very nice to have you all here. So um, now then, how should we do a panel debate? Is there anything that you'd like to respond to directly from the talk, or um, any um, 
I don't know, any, any issues that you think need raising that haven't been raised so far? Would anyone like to pitch in with any of those kind of things, or should I pick on more specific questions? I can see the evidence generation, if that's okay. So Get through I just wanted to do that. So you, you said that um, we shouldn't be doing lab experiments, and obviously there are lab experiments, but there's usually rats and then people. Give a idea. <laughs> so so we, can, we can look directly at that, the harms, the physiological harms of some of these pollutants. And I, again, my understanding is that when we look at the uh, epidemiological environmental studies, they're not always kind of well linked to those sort of animal models. So it's just a case of let's work out the relative risk of having an average exposure of X amount of particulates and relate that to cardiovascular disease rates, work out attributable risk, work out number of deaths. Um, so have things, are things moving on a little bit from that? So in terms of the, the explicitly the link between, specifically the link between toxicology? Yeah. As far as I'm aware, EPA's um, scientific advisory board is often more apt to use the criteria coming from the the cohort studies that yeah. are tracking people across time as they have since really the early 90s. Um, I'm not familiar with the toxicology literature, um, so I can't say whether on a consistent basis for the criteria air pollutants, PM10, SO2, NOx, etc., that those are informing the setting of standards. I think that they are much more likely to when thinking about the regulation of toxics, mm -hmm. right? These sort of other benzenes and things like that that are not part of the, the criteria of pollution bin. I think the other thing it is that even if you're looking at short-term effects, mm -hmm. your main environment is long-term chronic effects, there are further ethical, ethical constraints mm -hmm. because people who have serious asthma and all those can't be tested as well, so there are limitations. I think what we've what the literature's tried to do, and maybe this is how we see it in the UK, those cohort studies of shown association, which I think people initially were somewhat sceptical about in terms of causality. Right. And where the toxicology and the detailed studies not of whole whole people but of mechanisms mm -hmm. has helped us to develop a mechanistic understanding of how it can be that very small concentrations of fine particles could be accelerating the death of people through cardiovascular disease. So it's, it's not that the toxicology is setting the standard, but it's providing some supporting mechanism for the association. But I think understanding the limitations of those epidemiological studies, yeah. the cohort studies is really sure. important. There's a small number of them, almost all of them in the States, very few outside Europe and North America. Yes. They're following people from, what, 20, 30 years old? Onwards. Yeah, so they don't capture the full right. lifetime effects of air pollution, which we now believe is from prenatal and neonatal through uh, to over a lifetime, those things aren't captured. So there are right. real limitations to these studies, right. uh, which have to be taken into account in terms of the decline evaluation. Yeah. Mm. But presumably there are opportunities with the, you know, I don't, I don't want to diss any econometricians, but with the sort of natural experiments, quasi experiments, in the US you're looking at gradual and actually quite small reductions of bloom and then modelling that against against outcomes. So we could look at, you know, we could look at uh, manufacturing in China or India where there's been a sudden sort of explosion sure. mm. of, uh, of, and, and model that against health outcomes. Yep. And that would give us a clearer signal. Also maybe well. some of the changes in the other direction, like recession. Yeah. Right, and, and one of the papers I referenced in response to, to the earlier question did just that along the Hoa River. Right, yeah. There was a uh, uh, home heating, no home heating policy, I think, was the change, and it yeah. resulted in a, a dramatic difference okay. just along that yeah. along that boundary. Yeah. And the estimate in terms of health effect on mortality was actually smaller than the cohort studies yeah. from the U.S. And I think part of the intuition behind that was the flattening of the dose response function at high levels of PM2.5. Sure. But it's exploiting just that kind of technique yeah. um, that you're referring to, okay. bigger change. There are some really interesting econometric studies that I've seen one from the US um, where I think the policy was the introduction of the easy pass yes. um, to prevent idling uh, toll booths yes. and they found quite marked effects I think on, on some prenatal right. on birth uh, 
health outcomes they did and, and on neonatal uh, mortality rates as well, right? I think mm -hmm. that was Walker yeah. and Curry. Yeah. Yeah. So, so were yeah. they looking at, at residents or looking at people working in the booths? Residents. 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 Yeah. Residents. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Fascinating. Can I just ask Helen, Helen and James particularly, uh, we've heard um, <coughs> from, from Nick um, taking quite a cost-benefit type approach, um, which is sort of, you know, um, you know a, a traditional economic approach to this kind of area. Um, but it's not what we usually do in UK health economics. We don't often value benefits in monetary terms. I just wondered if, if you guys in the Centre for Health Economics were, were approaching this in a cost-benefit type way or whether you're using cost-utility, the qualities that um, Thomas mentioned. Yeah, I mean, I think um, as you were talking, I was thinking about the sort of US um, as compared to the US perspective, UK perspective. And certainly um, it's sort of well-recognised in the UK um, in terms of health economists to use the sort of MICE, that's the National Institute of Ca um, Care and Excellence um, approach to evaluation, which readily accepts these sort of extra welfare um, approaches where outcomes are measured in, in health and health quality of life and valued according to social preferences um, using a national tariff. Um, but of course we've got a sort of public sector approach to healthcare provision right. And I guess that influences the kind of methods that one uses. I was wondering more generally, um, in terms of the US perspective, and perhaps as far as I see it, or you may see it differently, sort of very much more private market approach to, to provision and how that influences the valuation. I'm, I'm not sure it, that it influences the valuation so much, because remember, the, the metric that I'm using, which is industry standard in a sense, right, for lack of a better term, is an average value that's applied socially, right? It's just coming from a different, um, it's coming from a different conceptual foundation, but it's being applied, I think, in the same way that is one value for, you said, a national tariff, mm -hmm. right? So it's being applied in that same way. So I don't think that the spirit of private versus public is generating a difference in how the value is applied. I think the difference is in how the value is estimated. Mm -hmm. right. um, I mean, certainly colleagues um, in the chair, I think, I don't know what Chaitons thinks, but I mean, there's little work going on in willingness to pay and sort of more cost-benefit analysis approaches, although perhaps some of our global health team, <coughs> here, uh, I, I, I don't know if they see more of that type of willingness to pay approach being used. Um, yeah, I think, well, I'd probably agree with what you're both saying in the um, the way it's applied is very similar. So you have a unit of health. We tend to use the quality, as has already been mentioned, and then it has some tariff applied to it. But um, for our uh, purposes, we try and think of that as the opportunity cost that arises from public sector spending. So it's very much sort of a public sector oriented way of thinking about it. Um, and in order to do that, it is slightly different how then those values are obtained as well. So. Um, for the, the NICE threshold that Helen mentioned NICE earlier, um, the idea behind it is essentially that if we were to spend the money on NHS activities elsewhere, it would generate this much health, so that the new thing coming in, or the new policy that's being evaluated, needs to be at least as good as that to be right. accepted. So it's kind of like an opportunity cost um, way of thinking about it, and we tend to Try, well, we're doing some work at the moment in Centre for Health Economics in York where we try and estimate the relationship between expenditure and health outcomes, again, qualities, um, and then that informs our opportunity cost rather than going down the road to <coughs> sort of reveal preference or state yep. of preference methods. And is that, is, is the link between expenditure and health outcome made in, strictly in terms of public sector expenditure or is that gathering information from individual choices across the country? Well, again, it's kind of because of the UK, the vast, it, I was thinking about the healthcare setting and the vast majority of spending is public uh, right, healthcare but expenditure. Right, things like purchasing vitamins or oh, you know, yeah. things that... Yeah, and outside, outside the healthcare system, of course, the, you know, the Department of Transport would use a similar approach to yours. Mm -hmm. They'd have a statistical value of life rather than using a quality right. type approach. So, so the quality... The quality metric is, is pretty much focused on on the NHS, really, on the, on, on the healthcare system. Outside that, you know, they they use similar methods to what you're talking about, I think. 
Okay, um, Johan, can you can you hear us all? And, and would you like to would you like to add anything? Yeah, um, I can hear you very well. Good. So I would like to put into the debate. It's um, my experience of working in developing countries. Um, so we recently held a policy dialogue um, as part of this thing called the Climate and Clean Air Coalition. And there are members of that who are from different African, Asian, Latin American countries. So what we were asking um, uh, was what are the science needs that you require, um, and this is often to ministries of environment, in order to increase the interest in um, the issue of air pollution. And um, so they mentioned, you know, the, the need to estimate the health impacts, which has been discussed here. Um, but also, they definitely um, talked about the demand for some sort of economic assessment of the um, of the impacts and the benefits of taking action, because they feel that they, without the quantitative information, they can't motivate policy change. Um, so they definitely think it's worth making. Now, in, in terms of the different um, cost estimates, then of course we can calculate direct costs, but we don't always have data from developing countries. But at least there's a, um, it's relatively simple when you're comparing the direct costs of uh, mitigation to the de direct cost for health. Um, but of course that's incomplete, and so we then have the, the VSL approaches um, to cope with the the, you know, the full cost of air pollution, but it becomes more difficult to explain what this means, you know. And so, if we use the willingness to pay approaches, then in developing countries, there's often a limited data for about willingness to pay. But also, I feel that um, policymakers sometimes get a bit lost in what it actually represents. Um, when they're comparing the costs of mitigation to the value of the health impacts um, uh, using these these approaches. So, um, and then of course, the willingness to pay in a country will depend on its uh, GDP, so you tend to have lower values, and then that's what I see as being the, the controversy that, that is there. And unfortunately, the the work that uh, Nicholas did in the unit WMO assessment um, didn't make it to the su summary for decision makers because of the worry by unit that it was going to create more controversy. Um, so um, I, I guess a question I'd like to ask is, you know, how do we uh, provide a simple explanation of when we're comparing the cost of mitigation to the benefit valued using willingness to pay methods in a way which is easily accessible by decision makers because I feel that sometimes it gets ignored because of the complexity of explaining what it actually represents. So I was wondering if if Nicholas had or others had um, um, you know some guidance on how we can um, develop these numbers and get them used to influence policy in, in a very clear way. So in terms of the development side uh, that is the development of the numbers. Um, I, I don't have a, a, a sort of a, a silver bullet or a solution. It's a matter of, of doing field work in those particular parts of the world that lack the estimates. I know China and India are places where folks in my shoes have, have developed VSL or willingness to pay based estimates. And um, they've done that in a, in a defensible way. On the how do we explain the complexity or the intuition behind what the metric is actually representing, I think well, I used it, so I'm revealing my own preference for using this approach to explanation, but we, we actually, lots of folks make these trade-offs all the time in their daily context, in their, in their daily lives. And finding a, a uh, country-specific way in which that trade-off is made, I think would go a long way towards relaxing people and backing them away from the thought that this is about valuing lives, which it's not. So when I said to the audience, you know, when we purchase a smoke detector, that's relevant to all of us, and I saw a lot of nodding, like, oh, yeah, I get that trade-off. Now, that's not going to work in all parts of the world, but I would argue that there are probably 
instances in which that trade-off is being made. Money for risk, money for risk. Mm -hmm. And if policymakers could focus on that, uncovering what those uh, contextual specific trade-offs are, I think would be pretty helpful. But that's just my view. So perhaps um, Johan and perhaps Mike as well. How, how in these developing countries is, is, is air quality measured? How's it, how's it modeled? How's it managed? Well, you're talking about a vast range of countries with yes. different infrastructure and facilities. Well, absolutely. So but I suppose, you know, when, when you think about all the little, little monitors around a city like York that, that we have, and clearly we're, we're in a completely different part of the world with a different set of technology and priorities. Maybe just to give you one example, we, my colleagues have just done a small pilot study in an informal settlement in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. A huge city, yeah. rapidly developing, very polluted. There are one or maybe two stations yeah. on a rooftop in the centre of town in the suburban area. Mm -hmm. That's all there is. Right. And those by no means at all <coughs> capture what's happening to those people, <coughs> those impoverished people subjected to informal waste burning, local factory emissions, household fuel combustion, mm. massive indoor air pollution. Mm. And, and that actually is not an insignificant problem in developed countries as well. I hasten to add, but it's extreme in that sort of setting. Mm. So I think the, if you go to Sub-Saharan Africa, if you go to Latin America, uh, in many countries in Asia, the monitoring is very limited yeah. and really does not capture the true exposure and therefore the true impacts of often those people who, to whom those have in, health impacts are going to be most severe and most important. So how do we base, I don't know, what, what do we base calculations on? What do we base estimates and models on? Perhaps well, I could input yeah. a bit. Yeah, great. So um, we're actually here, um, this is a, an area where we're trying to, to help a number of different countries. Um, to use the, on the modelling front. So some countries um, do have monitoring in cities um, and we're going to be wor we're working at the moment with Ghana and in Accra they have seven permanent monitoring stations. So that's quite unusual for um, West Africa but um, we're then going to be um, trialling the development of a, a tool which can estimate emissions, look at atmospheric transfer, and um, estimate concentration of PM2.5, and then you, you use those concentration response functions that we discussed to estimate um, premature mortality. So um, we're working with um, the, the national government there, and in a further 10 countries um, around the world, in Asia, Latin America, and Africa, to, to try and give them um, the tools to start to estimate, um, give quantitative numbers for the emissions, for the um, impacts, and we would like to add valuation to it because there is a demand for it, and it's a question of how to do that the best way. So there's a real demand for quantitative numbers because they feel they can't motivate policy change without having some numbers about what, how big the problem is and um, what the impact it's causing. So I have one anecdotal piece. Um, presumably one of the constraints on air pollution monitoring networks is cost. Right? Just the, the device themselves. Um, I was recently on leave at Carnegie Mellon and found out that there's an effort uh, underway to develop low cost cell phone, smartphone sized uh, PM monitors mm -hmm. that, you know, there, there's lots of issues associated with them at this point, but the idea that we could move from high cost, low number of observation yeah. networks to much lower cost, higher density networks is perhaps worth worth mentioning as, as a uh, target moving forward. Well, absolutely. That's a very important development, but we need to be very careful about the accuracy of the yes. term cost yes. methods. And actually, the study I was mentioning, you know, got the people in the community themselves to take simple low-cost monitors around and understand their own sense yes. of what they experience. But I, I think it, you mentioned equity, and I think that's really important yes. when we address these questions. You talked about it in terms of primary evaluation. But of course, it's also to do with the greater exposure often of poor communities, the greater sensitivity in terms of the health impacts. So all of these things need to be captured. And it's also about what are the interventions that are important. Mm -hmm. It may be for those particular communities, it's a completely different set of interventions. Indoor. With, with indoor probably is, yeah. is definitely most cost effective right. Right. in terms of these interventions than some mm -hmm. of the broad national monitoring 
when you're looking at the big power stations and kind of and so on. So this issue of scale and how it addresses the, cons the impacts and the concerns of particular impoverished communities is really important. So, and Johan mentioned working with national governments, but it's more than just national governments mm -hmm. in terms of addressing this problem and quantifying what the benefits are. Okay. Would any, anyone else like to pick up on any of the other equity issues here? I mean, you know, between, between communities, between generations, um, all these different sort of, how do, we, how do we build any of this into an economic model? I think those intergenerational issues are very important, actually. I mean, I didn't guess, get from you talking about how far that's addressed, but particularly if you in terms of thinking about the benefits, and who benefits and by how much. It's not the association, it's the avoidable right. of impacts, which, of course, can change a lot of other societal factors change at the same time. Right. And air pollution is one of a number of risk factors associated with premature cardiovascular or respiratory right. mortality. Mm. Uh, so if we change the air pollution levels now, maybe it won't make much difference to the life expectancy of somebody who's on the cusp, as it were, I can say that. But you know, what does it mean for a young child? Right. For an ethnic environment, not so much here, mm. but in Germany, as Lisa mentioned, other places. Yeah. What's their lifetime? So I was just reading before the talk, uh, catching up on, on some a form of grading, if you will, um, a senior thesis at Middlebury focusing on human capital formation among young kids and getting them into school and keeping them in school. And certainly, exposure to air pollution has been associated with missing school. Mm. And so, you know, point taken, right? I, I hope. Perhaps I wasn't clear enough in saying this is one slice, and what I presented is one slice, an imperfect slice of an annual impact. And there are all these sort of cumulative human capital formation type effects that manifest in ways that, as of yet, we're not really able to, to capture. Yeah. Which speaks to the intergenerational piece, mm -hmm. because the human capital piece does last lifetimes. Yeah. OK. Well, I see all kinds of interesting perspectives around around the room, certainly from the people I know, and I know that's not all of you, but do you have any, any questions or comments or just thoughts that, that you'd like to make around this whole area? Yes, please. Spoken from pure ignorance, but it seems like this suffers from the same issues as the whole climate change discussion about 20, 30 years ago, where there's enough models to provide some really interesting information, but not enough to provide a particular consensus for any particular location. Is there any any movement towards that kind of consensus building model matching kind of uh, behavior for these types of questions? So one one context that I can um, employ to provide an answer would be about a decade ago, uh, a number of us modeling the impacts of sulfur dioxide from power plants, coal-fired power plants in the U.S started to see evidence that the, the cap, the aggregate limit on emissions in the US for that pollutant appeared to be far too high according to cost-benefit tools. So if you value those tons, the ton at the margin was about um, an order of magnitude more expensive than it was to remove that ton. My model was suggesting this, other models were, and you know, back to association instead of causation here, clearly as I make this comment, um, a couple of years later, when there were revisions made to the cap, they were in the ballpark of what we were seeing as far as what looked like equating the benefit per ton to the cost per ton. So in terms of thinking about consensus across research teams, in terms of thinking about consensus across different modeling types and different modeling approaches, that's an example where I can't say it caused the change, but the change did follow on the heels of the publication of, of those results. But I think it's also a question around how far, of course, we can improve the economic valuation, we can improve the air pollution modeling and the effects. I guess there's an interesting question around how far do you actually need to improve it right. before you demonstrate the need for action. So the estimates in the UK mm -hmm. is that we have 40,000 uh, additional premature cases of premature mortality a year <coughs> and the combined effects of PM2.5 and PM2. That's a huge health burden, mm -hmm. to my non-economic sort of naive way of looking at it. <laughs> it's I only thought that's yeah. a, it's a big number. Mm -hmm. It should have cost it's 20 billion pounds or something in terms of your figures. Right. It, that seems to me to be a huge policy driver. And you can just imagine what the numbers are in Delhi or in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we actually need to wait 
these refinements uh, and these improvements in terms of methodology to, to be able, you know, to, to demonstrate the seriousness of the situation and the potential benefits of action. So why aren't policymakers acting? Mm. Well, that's a good question. <laughs> 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 Thomas, well, I'm going to jump on our doorstep. You've just elected a new one, not we, a new London mayor, and on the basis of some figure that says 10,000 people died because of air pollution, he will now increase the tax on toxic vehicles. So these models do work. I just my question to you really was, how did he get this number of 10,000? Where does that come from? <laughs> it, it comes from an, an official advisory body committee on air, the medical effects of air pollution. Uh, who basically review the health evidence and do the calculations and work out the methodologies. I think that particular number for London comes from Public Health England who've done, 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 then done the calculation borough by borough across London. But I'm looking a bit because she actually sits on Comey and she might be able to... I do. People spend a lot of time agonising over those calculations. So they will look at all the data that are available, do measure views, and just try and come up with the best number. And quite usually on the committee, there's an understanding that you have to be really careful using these coefficients. But what the press will go and do immediately is <laughs> tell us that 40,000 people a year will die and that 120 have died so far in Camden this year. So that's the point of the is how you use these coefficients. I think, I think it's really to that, that term, mortality, because we could say premature mortality, according to Kermia, that's a statistical kind of con construct or artifact to do the calculations from the epidemiology, that very easily gets translated into deaths in the media. <coughs> and people have this public perception that kind of, you know, air pollution comes along and somebody who's perfectly healthy drops dead. <laughs> Actually, it's, you know, it's one of a vast number of risk factors, you know, like obesity and exercise and diet, etc., 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 smoking, which can precipitate a cardio cardiovascular death or a spiritual death, you know, a little earlier. So that's what, it, that's what we're really saying. It's just one of those factors. There's lots of public health action on all of those other things, but mm. relatively little. Just a 10,000 number, does it mean 10,000 life years, or what does it actually mean? <laughs> Their official figure, but Nick could correct me, is if you, if you imagine there were those 29,000, I'm talking the UK figure now, 29,000 for PM2.5, and you imagine there was an equal risk across, across the population, I think it's nine months of, life, of years of life lost. To translate it like that. But the problem is we don't know how it's distributed across the population. That's the average figure, but it could be if it was only those 29,000 people, I think the, the value is 12 years of life lost. Something like, something like that. So the problem is translating it to what actually an individual person experiences in terms of potential life loss or risk of death. And that, of course, will depend on whether they exercise, what they do, you know. It isn't air pollution alone, it's how air pollution interacts with all those other risk factors that's important. And that's partially why there's a, sort of a big inequality aspect to it all as well, because um, not only are there more greater emissions of pollutants in deprived areas, but deprived areas also have high base <coughs> sort of vulnerability to the kind of conditions that would lead them to suffer if they were to air quality. So they face a sort of double whammy if you're from a deprived area in terms of the effects of air quality. Right. The inability to engage in a very behavior, mm -hmm. go inside, turn on air conditioning, or whatever the case may be, just compounds that. Mm -hmm. It's not clear cut in the UK, so I think Public Health England's report was, was that the most polluting area was Kensington and Chelsea and Westminster. Mm -hmm. In that case, it might be levelling out the inequalities and you know, bringing the cardiovascular risk of the wealthier people. To the <laughs> 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 right, so, um, well, Kensington uh, Chelsea is a funny place. It is because there's a, funny a very wealthy bit, and then there's a very yeah. used to be North Kensington until they get definitely cleansing. But I, I, I think, in terms of you know what what you know what Sadiq Khan is, is is planning to do, I don't think any of these proposals. You know, if he brought these proposals in 12 years ago, they wouldn't have worked. It's only because they're sort of following on this sort of incremental change. You know, so they, they got the congestion charging in first, and, and that was bloody difficult. And then they got the funding <coughs> for the bikes, and then you, you're sort of building on that. And I think there's there's a limit to what people will accept. I was you know, thinking back to those pictures of, of Pittsburgh. We had similar, you know, very drastic events in London. You know, you, you can look at the sort of 1940s, 1950s studies where you had big smogs. And you could immediately see 
the effect that that had on, on right. death. You've seen big right. peaks in deaths yeah. right. and big peaks in hospital admissions, and people could see it. You could, right. you know, people would not see it. You know, you couldn't see down the end of the street, and it was very visible. And that means that then people want to act on that. Whereas now it's invisible, mm -hmm. you know. So you're you're trying to get across that you are constantly exposed to this invisible yeah, toxic. Yeah, yeah. And it, it's difficult, and you're 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 uh, asking people to take in positions. So when they tried to do a congestion charging in Greater Manchester along mm -hmm. the lines of the London one, um, uh, the, you know the, the the population didn't swallow it. They didn't want it, and and the local MPs actually from a, from within Manchester wanted it. But they had to get agreement from those in the leafy suburbs around, you know. And we have a Liberal MP in, in Stockport who, all the way through his, his campaign to get elected, and said that you know I'm terribly green. I want to do things for the environment. He suddenly realised he was now responsible for a constituency that included Wilmslow and Bramall and lots of people who drove big SUVs. And suddenly <laughs> he flipped, and now he was against it because it was not in his political interest to support this congestion charge, which would affect his constituents <coughs> and from which they would not benefit because it's protecting the lungs of the people in Greater Manchester that they were going to drive their SUVs through. <laughs> you know, so so it, it's it's difficult to get the. You need to get a lot of people to agree to move in the same direction and you have to act to, them to very often act against their own best interests yeah. to do it. So, so it, it can be very difficult. Yeah. Yes, please. So are the, the, the estimates of the kind of health um, uh, damages and therefore the kind of financial costs, do we think generally across the panel, are we underestimating them currently? Are we overestimating them? Are we about right? Are we being too conservative? Just to get a feel, mm -hmm. we're talking about the WHO and stuff, yeah. giving out numbers. Where are we at? Can we Johan, why don't you pitch in first? Because <laughs> <laughs> once, once we let this, this lot go, you won't get a word in. So do you want me to intervene now? Yes, why not? <laughs> oh, are we are we about right or overall underestimating health costs and economic costs? Oh, well, I'm not an economist, so I would bat that one back to Nicholas Muller. But I, I think that it's, um, um, I, I would like to see more data on the, the direct costs. Um, we're actually going to start doing some stuff with the World Health Organization to try and understand the cost to the health sector in different countries. Um, but I do think that it's this, um, the big numbers are always the mortality, and then that uses this um, value of statistical life, which is an awful name. Um, but, you know, I don't think that anyone's come up with anything better than that. Um, but whether that is a, um, you know, a, a, how good the numbers are that come from that, I'd rather ask an economist. So I'd back that one back to the... Uh, Okay, well we've got three in the room, so let's give them let's give them a go. Well since I'm not a economist, you won't get an answer from me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's but go in. To, but, but just leave it so maybe if I just add something to what you answered and then we can let the economists come in. So from my point of view, I think the values are probably if we if we think think about this in terms of the values in the UK, okay? If you if you're asking about the values globally, mm. then there's so many vast uncertainties it'd be very hard to estimate. My, but what my guess is because we're relying on sort of broad population average sort of concentrations, we're missing a lot of very highly exposed people uh, who have got a much bigger impact. Yeah. And my other argument for saying something to underestimate is we're only costing or valuing or estimating a limited number of impacts. Mm -hmm. I've already mentioned perinatal and neonatal effects. So the evidence for perinatal for, 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 for effects in, during pregnancy is becoming stronger and stronger. And low birth weight and premature birth can have vast consequences throughout people's lives. And mm -hmm. because of that. Those aren't in the picture at all. So I would argue because there's very significant lifetime effects from early childhood even, or even before that we're not actually capturing and including in these estimates, we're only capturing part of the picture, which I think is the answer that yeah. you've already given anyway. Well, yeah, it is, and it's just worth reiterating, right? I mean, there's. The methodological piece, are we valuing what we can value accurately? And then there's the, are we missing stuff? And I think that it's probably true, I'm just conjecturing, but it's probably true that the latter component is, in a sense, bigger, right? I mean, n nobody's really looking at ecosystem effects in the, in the monetization space in a way that 
reasonably reveals a value for a species, right? It's just really hard to imagine doing, and we know these effects are there. The second thing is, I, this isn't fair, what I'm going to say, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> there are policy constraints, as I talked about. So we'll never be able to, um, even if we wanted to, in an unconstrained black box where we have the values that vary by race, by age, by income, and we could do this perfectly, you can't. Secondly, there's no ex post revelation of value in this, in this space. You can't go back after the policy intervention and say, well, really, what was your willingness to pay? What, what's, what is your value? It just doesn't happen. So it's a really important question. It's an unanswerable question, in a sense, to a degree of precision. And therefore, I think the first piece is the one we need to focus on. That is, what are we missing? And can we do better there? Any, any other comments on that one? Or you no, I think mean, it's monstrously inaccurate. But we'll, we'll, you know, I don't, I don't think you know, we're never going to get a, a very accurate figure. But I don't think anyone on this panel thinks it's protected. You know, that yeah. exposure to particulates is, is, is going to reduce your right, carbon right, right. Right. So, so I think we're, we're, what we're arguing about is just how damaging it is, yeah. and, and what kind of cost you can you can put on that. But I think we've got sophisticated enough that we can put a lower bound on that. Right and say, you know, even if we accept the lower bound, it's going to be cost effective to, to come in with some of these interventions. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a question back, back there. Yeah, so I, I represent a local um, pressure group on congestion. I'm very interested in your comments on the, um, uh, the movement of cars from outside to in. But my, I, one of the levers I think that we want to try and use is the link between um, congestion that appeared on the monitoring station. The one just outside my children's school but I noticed that the, it doesn't ever really hit the limits of the EU puts on it, which is one of the levers that we can use against uh, to try to pressure the council into doing something about it. So what does the panel think about the, the sort of temporal variations in these statistics, where there are spikes that follow the daytime, but then don't meet the averages that then trigger the EU warnings and so forth? Is it, you should just hire your car next to it all day. <laughs> 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 it's a variation question. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm discouraged and fascinated by the fact that environmental standards are almost always on the mean. They're not always, but they're almost always on the mean. And I'm, I'm doing research currently that looks at not the second moment, which is the variance, but the third, which is skewness, which is we can have a, a satisfaction of a standard and not only have days that vary above it, but have that one killer day Right where you know in Phoenix, I'm aware of a reading in, within the last 10 years there was 900. Right, so those happen, and what I'm not sure how we interpret them. I'm not sure how epidemiologists think about those days, but I think this is a fascinating and important topic. It is. And I, I'm not an epidemiologist. I, ha I hasten to add, uh, and I think the difficulty is for these cohort studies. You're looking at people's exposure over decades. Mm -hmm. you, you can't. You can't relate that. We don't know how important the peaks are right. as opposed to the means. Uh, but what you can do in terms of symptoms and people's lung function is to move them quickly from one place to another. So there have been studies in London, for example, where people have been moved from a very congested part of Oxford Street next to lots of diesel and buses into Hyde Park. Have I got the right park? Anyway, into the park. And you can see that effect immediately. Now, we can't, of course we can't check that, but for mortality it's like the sort of ethical problems of putting people in chambers. But there is evidence around which suggests that those short-term peaks will have effects on people's lung function and maybe even on their asthma symptoms. So, you know, that, that's the sort of evidence you have to use. But if you compare it with the means that are based on these long-term epidemiological studies, we just don't know. And, and yeah, uh, for, for that, uh, perhaps I could uh, smaller intervention. Yeah, sure. Um, one thing that's uh, interesting is that when we're talking about these guidelines, whether they're WHO or EU or whatever, is that um, um, they are sort of considered to be, you know, something that is relatively clean. But it doesn't mean to say there are no impacts below those limits. Um, so I was talking to Michael Brower, who's an epidemiologist in Canada, and he's been finding impacts down to 2 micrograms per meter cubed of PM2.5, which is below the WHO guideline of 10. And I think somebody mentioned that there is 
evidence that there is no threshold to damage by PM 2.5. So um, I think there's one thing about complying with the regulation, but it doesn't mean that there are no um, benefits to go even cleaner um, and new evidence is supporting that. But I, I, it's really interesting. I mean, children here are a really sensitive group, and as I've emphasised a couple of times, we don't, just don't know what the lifetime consequences mm. of this early exposure is. And yet we don't have that kind of preventative And we know that from, from history. Don't we know that from the kind of Pittsburgh and London smogs and that kind of thing? What, what well, the principles and the data is there, but I don't mm -hmm. know. I don't think people have... Uh, right. Well, yeah, actually no. having the quantitative relationship, I'm not sure that's there. Oh, that's a nice PhD. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 it's kind of, because at those times you weren't really monitoring you know, anything like the lab in terms no. of how you, how you reproduce it. But we had I, I can remember wandering through the London smogs and mm -hmm. survived so far. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it, there are states in the US where you can't build a new school within 200 metres of a freeway in California. Is that true? I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. So there are, you know, there are, regardless of the economics, there are areas of the US which have recognised this particular right. exposure and, and limited where you can build at least new schools and take measures to reduce the exposure in existing schools. I am an epidemiologist, so, so <laughs> I don't know do that. But, but, um, the, uh, there's, a, there's a general problem we have, and it's not just environmental, uh, health and environmental uh, sciences, it's more generally within health services researchers that we, we do tend to look at averages. And I think this is one of the, these areas where that is, is completely inappropriate. Yeah, so so uh, there are you know, those of us who, who actually now look at ranges and look at fluctuations and, and consider what we call critical periods. So for a school, a critical period would be when you actually expose. It's when the kids are going into the school and coming out of the school, and that's likely to be when you're actually getting the peaks of pollution mm -hmm. because it's commuters and parents dropping them off in the car. So, so you, you should be looking at those periods when, when they're, they're most at risk and looking at, at, at spikes or, or looking at levels at those particular times. There's no point doing a 24-hour average. So one of the reasons why I asked is I, I read a paper that came out from Imperial College this year where they actually looked at PM10s and SO2s mm. and they used an integrated uh, additive unit. So they took a, a unit of exposure and then added it across people's lifetimes. Mm. And the results of that were truly frightening. And I guess I wasn't I hadn't seen anything about NO2 exposure, which of course all NOx exposures, which should be uh, kind of the equivalent of sort of fright on now. So I was just wondering about if there's any yeah. further analysis on the NOx data. But again, you shouldn't necessarily wait. You know, if, if you wait for the council to do something, or if you wait for the national government to do something, you'd be waiting a long time. So I, I think if you can make the case to to governors, you know, and there are schools that do um, uh, walk to school days and all the rest of it, to try and you know, to try and protect that <coughs> population of kids within those schools. So you don't have to wait for for you know the words come from on high or legislation to come through. I think there's local activism that you can. Advance, which which you can address some of those concerns without having to wait for the evidence to to, to be approved and for policymakers to act on it. Okay. Well. Oh, sorry. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Um, but just thinking of peak ex or peak um, loads of air pollution, some things like PM are driven by natural um, occurrences like wildfire or volcanoes and things. Um, is, is there room in the model to to bring in those kinds of things that are, are natural and aren't really they're external from the market fully? Sure. So um, the, the most obvious place, as I think about your question, is the emission inventories. Um, albeit in an imperfect way, do both document and include biogenic sources. And so there's the classic dust storm, wildfire, um, but then there's perhaps more. Um, less intuitive sources, that is uh, emissions from vegetation, that are an important part of PM 2.5 in the southeastern U.S., I'm not sure about in, in Europe. Um, and, I mean, those are really difficult problems to tackle, right? We have a hard enough time curtailing our own right, emissions and our own sort of drive to produce things and consume things. Um, but suffice it to say that in, from a modeling perspective, they're there. And from a modeling perspective, at least in principle, the modeler could permute those to understand what is their average effect, what what share of the burden 
um, they're contributing insofar as we believe the inventories. It's, it's a good point. Okay. Well, I think it's it's nearly time for a little drink of some kind. So um, let me let me welcome Lisa back to um, wrap up. And um, yeah, Lisa. Okay, thanks uh, ever so much, everybody. I'll do a quick thank you in just a minute. Um, I thought it we were sort of talking earlier who's going to do a summing up of all of this, and I will do a very brief sum up. I think. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion. Thank you so much for all the interaction that we've had, um, people in the audience, the panel, with Johan, done a fantastic job in Stockholm. It's always <laughs> difficult when you're, when you're offline. Um, I mean, I think in summary, I think we can see that there's lots of difficulties and uncertainties in trying to make these assessments. It really looks like there is a problem, a big problem, that's still continuing to increase and get worse in particular par parts and places around the world. Um, and therefore, policymakers and, and I guess ourselves as well, in terms of our individual behaviour, need to be doing something about this to try and uh, reduce the impact. So that's perhaps the kind of main take-home message. And then, it, by the sounds of it, there are lots of sort of additional bits of research, and PhD studentship projects, and everything else that, that could actually go in and pick apart many of the different uh, sort of more detailed aspects that we've talked about here today. So that's that's been really great and, and we have an opportunity now for people to continue to have these discussions and, and network outside, we have drinks, we have nibbles so please don't go away uh, stay behind and talk to people unfortunately you're hand you can't do much to do that so <laughs> we'll have a drink for you um, so a, a so proper <laughs> best I can do, I'm sorry um, so proper thank you, thank you ever so much to Nick for coming all this way and being here and giving such an interesting talk, that was fantastic. It's really nice to see you all after <coughs> five or so years. Um, to all our panel members, um, thank you ever so much for coming along and really sort of helping get a, a nice and lively debate and asking questions of each other, I think was great. Um, thanks ever so much as well, Karen, that was um, perfectly chaired. That was wonderful. And the people I really shouldn't forget are standing at the back. So we've got Sheila. Um, who from Yesi, who has really made all of this possible. Thank you ever so much for all the help that you put into organising this. And Howard, who's helped with the other AV people um, to make sure that we had the connection with Stockholm. That was making me a little bit nervous, <laughs> I have to say. Um, so that's all worked really well. And again, big thank you to all of you for being here and coming and, and contributing so actively. And maybe the next one might touch a little bit more on ecosystems and air pollution, food security and food access and things like that, which would be nice. Um, okay, thank you very much. So a big round of applause. Thank <laughs> you.